And good morning, everyone. Welcome to church today. We, we've kind of got like an order of things that we do. You know, there's some traditions in church. And for us here at Generations Christian Church, we normally worship for a while, just cry out to our God and tell him how awesome he is. And uh, that kind of prepares our hearts for what I would say is the most important part of our time together, which is communion. And this week, uh, we're kind of mixing our order up, and we are going to uh, put that at the very end of the service because our, our subject for today is really communion. That is what we are talking about, and we're going to look at what God has to say. This series, we're in a summer series called These Things I Leave You, and the whole summer series is about uh, Jesus, after living his perfect life, dying on a cross, he raises from the dead victory over the grave. And in that moment, as Jesus comes back, he makes, he makes fish on the seashore there in, in the Galilee. And he's like, guys, I'm leaving again. But he does not leave us alone. He gives the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of us, those of us who believe in Jesus and have accepted him as our Savior. The Spirit of God lives in us and equips us. These are the things that we are left with. We've been, we've been looking at these things. Today, we actually look at communion. Now, this week, a big week because we had the opportunity to celebrate 243 years as a sovereign nation, our independence. Uh, so I hope you had a great time doing that and no one got hurt with fireworks. I did not because we were at camp with a bunch of junior high kids. A lot of us got back on Friday. We had a bus full of junior high kids, an incredible time away with them. This coming week, we have high school kids. Um, But we were celebrating still, nonetheless, 243 years. Jesus shows up and he kind of, he basically interrupts 1,500 years of tradition. When Christ institutes, he makes it a thing. That's, a, he, that's what it is when you institute something. He's like, hey, we're, I'm going to make a thing called communion. He interrupts 1,500 years of the most important patriotic Jewish holiday. The Jews, for all of those years, have been celebrating Passover. This is when Moses comes and says, let my people go. And God calls Israel out of Egypt and makes them a nation. For 1,500 years, they come together to have a meal called the Passover. This is when God spared them, and the Spirit comes in and kills the firstborn son. And that finally enrages Pharaoh so much that he's like, get out of town. It is that salvation moment for Israel that they were celebrating where Jesus stands up at that meal and says, new plan, new way to connect with me. That is what we commemorate Every single week here. Now, our core verse for the week is John 6, uh, 53. But I've got to tell you, before, before I read this, I don't want to just read it and then everyone like puts on their church filter and like, yeah, it's something weird. Jesus said it. I don't understand it. Whatever. It's weird. I would say that what Jesus says in John 6 is the strangest thing that Jesus ever said, which is saying a lot because he said lots of strange things. I don't know if uh, you are aware of this or not, but not only did we celebrate July 4th this, this weekend, but Netflix decided to release their popular series, Stranger Things 3, season three on July the 4th, because no one's at work and people can binge watch eight episodes or stay up till two in the morning. So if some of you look really tired, I, it's probably because you weren't working the late shift, but you were on episode seven at like 3 a.m. last night, right? <laughs> I know you're, you're making yourself look guilty by laughing so hard right now. So uh, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not promoting stranger things, but I'm telling you in the spirit of Paul, when Paul walked into Ephesus and Paul's like, hey, I see the culture. I, I see what's going on. Stranger things is appropriately named. It's a coming of age series about a young, bunch of young people that encounter strange things. And if you were to know someone that sees one of these episodes, they would say the same thing to you about stranger things that people said to Jesus when Jesus was talking. Like their reaction would be the same. Let's look at what I think is Jesus's most strange saying. It's found in John 6, 53. Here it is. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Oh, come on, that is weird, right? I mean, at face value, that's like zombie walking dead stuff. You can't hear that and be like, oh, that sounds right, okay. I mean, I get it. Maybe like the people that are there originally when Jesus says that, they're like, hey, there's a deeper meaning, right? Right, right? Because that's freaking us all out, Jesus. That's what he says, and it does. It freaks a lot of people out to the point where some people choose not to follow him. Here's, here's actually what they, what they say to this in verse 59. Then many of his disciples, when they heard these things, said, this is a difficult saying. Who can understand it? I'm going to interpret for you. This is cray cray. <laughs> That's what they're saying. That's what they're saying here. And in verse 56, we find out what actually happens. It says, after this, many of his disciples quit following him and did not accompany him any longer. And I would describe Christ's ministry early on. It's a little bit of a tour. They're going synagogue to synagogue, town to town, showing this Friday night, live and in person, the ministry of Jesus. He will say things. Now, this, this occurrence, this did not happen like the week of his death. This, this happened long before when his uh, followers and disciples were around the Sea of Galilee. He said this in a town called Capernaum. And when Jesus says this, there are people that are a part of the, probably just a little bit of a freak show. I mean, to be around the ministry of Jesus, he's making fish sandwiches out of, out of thin air, right? So there's free food. Sign me up. I'm in just for that, okay? I mean, if Jesus is cooking, that's going to be good, okay? So he's handing out free food. He's healing people, right? He's, he's setting up shop and he's teaching and saying stuff like this. If nothing else, it's going to be this. It's going to be a spectacle, I mean, everyone's going to come out. The sheep can watch themselves today. The fish can catch themselves. I'm going to go to town and see what's going on because Jesus healed my brother-in-law, Larry, and I got to figure this out, right? So people are there. And when they hear the strange thing that Jesus says about his flesh and about his blood, they say, no, no, I'm, I'm not doing this. I reject that. There is a simple and plausible explanation. Jesus is speaking in parables for those who are true believers. True belief is listening to him, seeing him for who he truly is, and taking his mission on as your life mission. That is what belief is. Seeing him for who he truly is. Really hearing him. John Wesley would say, eating his flesh is another way of saying, I truly believe. It wasn't that difficult to understand, but at face value, it definitely freaked some of the followers out. Jesus was foreshadowing what we do when we come to church. We have a meal. Uh, normally, our awesome serve team, they pass the trays and uh, you, you take two cups. The bread's always in the bottom. That way people aren't like touching all the bread, you know, and you get sick. Take two cups. The bread's in the bottom. The juice is in the top. And we have just a, a moment to do what Jesus said. Maybe you've heard it before. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the famous meal. Everyone gets on one side of the table. They take the picture. You've seen it, okay? It's that moment where Jesus institutes this meal for us. And Paul, who wasn't there, writes about it to a church in the Roman Empire called Corinth. And maybe you've heard Paul's description. Now, Paul was an apostle that was picked by Jesus. The apostles got together after Judas betrayed Jesus, and they picked a guy. Many of you probably don't know his name because the guy that Jesus picked was the best player for the other team, okay? You know, it's like he grabbed him, won him, NBA draft, it happened, brings him over, and Jesus spends three years with Paul in Arabia. So as Paul is writing this description, it's straight from Christ as he gives this to the church of Corinth. Here is Paul's rendition of how Christ instituted this meal. It's found in Corinthians, 1 first, first Corinthians 11, verse 24. Speaking of Jesus, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Those are the, the most simple instructions that we kind of hold to as a church for our practice of 
weekly, as often as we come together on the first day of the week, as the tradition of the early church, to remember Christ. But technically, um, I skipped some verses to, to, to bring that out to you. A lot of people know that, but they don't know what Paul was doing. See, Paul was writing to the church in Corinth 20 years, about 20 years after Christ's resurrection from the dead. So the church has got, you know, they're going. They got some structure. They've been, we're, Generations Christian Church is over 40 years old. So, I mean, you, you get tradition, right? I mean, they know one another. They've got practices. They've got their favorite songs, you know. Um, some things are going on. Paul writes to them in what I would call, get this, I would call it the very first ever come on man moment. Now, if you don't know what come on man is, you might not be an NFL fan, but the NFL season, it's here, okay? I, I know that you don't feel it, but I feel the tremors. It's starting, okay? And as the NFL season comes on, one of the best parts of the NFL season is a little shtick that ESPN has on Monday Night Countdown called Come On Man. Now, here's the premise. Uh, for those of you that are not into football, seems like that's all of you right now. Um, like, no, no sports fan. Uh, Come on, man, is the same. They, they film all these games. I mean, there are like 30 cameras at every game. And so the chances are on Sunday when people play games that they are going to catch players, coaches, people in the stands doing bonehead stuff. All right. And I'm personally counting on it because on Monday, me and the boys, we sit on the couch and we cannot wait for them to publicly humiliate people that have been caught on camera. Right? And they say to them all, they say, they, they film them doing this stuff, some mess up that's like just a bonehead move. And they say, all the sportscasters, come on, man. And it's really funny. It's more funny in my house than it is here today on Sunday. <laughs> we laugh at it. I don't know. It's popular all across America on TV. And I'm, 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 trans, I'm, I'm kind of like translating a little loosely here, but let me give you Paul's version of this in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. Here's Paul's come on man to the church in Corinth. Here's what he says. And the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. That's a strong rebuke. I mean, that is like come on church in Corinth. What are you doing when you get together for church? It's, it would be better for you not to have church than the church you're having. That's how messed up church is. And specifically when the early church got together, uh, everything was centered around communion. We talk about all the time here, if we were to strip away and you say, well, what's the most important part? Uh, the, the, the one thing that would stand above everything that we do when we gather together would be communion. This meal that we have, it, it is the focus of our time together. It's the thing that Christ left us. And they are doing something wrong in the way that they observe communion. And the question I, ha the question I have for all of us is like, if the early church that's only 20 years removed from Christ's life, and they've got people that walked with Jesus, like helping them figure out this dream of the body, if they're messing it up, what are the chances are that we need some redirection? personally and as a church. Well, we get that redirection in chapter 11 that's happening, but I think that we need to really understand what is going on in these guys' lives when Jesus stands up at that table and says, all right, you're gonna do this. Here's how you're gonna remember me. I would draw your attention to, because uh, it's fitting, it's, it's kind of 4th of July weekend here. We're, we're, we're wrapping up the festivities. Uh, one of the, the great expeditions in our histories uh, of, of our country the third president of our nation, Thomas Jefferson, had a dream of westward expansion, and he purchased the greatest real estate deal ever done, the Louisiana Purchase, which bought a massive tract of land, and Thomas Jefferson's belief and around 1802 was that just on the other side of the Louisiana Purchase, somewhere around the current day Idaho border, that there would be a gentle slope kind of like Kansas, a, a rolling plain, plateau, and in that plain would be a, a big river, a waterway. And that waterway would be a conduit for commerce, trade, quick, super easy travel all the way to the Pacific Ocean. He believed in this so much that he commissioned Lewis and Clark, maybe you heard about this uh, around fourth or fifth grade, Lewis and Clark to say, go and find this waterway that we could connect the Missouri River to and really just have an inner 
interstate that ran all the way through our nation. We would be rocking it. This was such an important endeavor. And this is, blows my mind. Uh, Spain sent two kill parties to stop them in their journey, Lewis and Clark. That's how important this was. 32 men embarked on a journey to find this massive riverway. Well, their travels took them, and they're carrying canoes because they fully expect to find this passageway, take them all the way to Limay Pass, 1805 August. Winter is setting in. And on a morning in August of 1805, they write in their journals, today is the day. Today we are going to come on the, the top of the Continental Divide and all of the rivers in this great country flow to the Pacific Ocean and we are going to find the biggest one and we're going to put these canoes in it and we are winning. What a great day today is. And they got to the top of that pass and their dreams were shattered because there's not a nice plain. There's hundreds and hundreds of miles of more mountain peaks. And what's been crazy about this journey is for six months, all of their Indian guides have been like, hey guys, the river doesn't exist. Your, your dreams will be shattered. And they're like, thanks for the news. Forge ahead, right? <laughs> and for over 30 days, they've seen nothing but white capped mountain peaks, but still they're forging ahead. And when they get to the top of that mountain pass with their canoes that they're ready to put in water, they're in uncharted territory. And they've got to figure out life. I would call you to look at these men that sat with Jesus on this night. They did not know that this was their last night before his death. Even though Jesus had been telling them over and over again, I'm going to die. No, no, I'm going I'm to have an agonizing death right before your eyes. You will run from me. You will abandon me. One of you will betray me. And at the very meal, they're like, this is great. Pass the gravy. They're not getting it. That they will, for the next 48 hours, their dreams will be shattered. And they will be running horrified, regretting a lot of things. Some of them that they even followed Jesus at all that they ever believed that there was a chance that he was the Messiah who would have a very different version of future for them. See, they had canoes ready when that was not what the landscape of their future had for them. And Jesus stood at that table giving us this meal saying, this is the way that you will connect with me. There is power in it. Don't do it wrong. None of them were thinking about what Jesus said at dinner. None of them were thinking about this instruction. But what happened was this. When Jesus appeared to over 500 people over the course of 40 days. And then the Holy Spirit came on the, on the 50th day called Pentecost. And understanding came from the church. And all of those who witnessed that meal that night said, do you remember how he told us to connect to him? There's some things that we need to know, that you need to know, very specifically where, like the church in Corinth, maybe we're not doing this right. If they messed it up, maybe we did. Matter of fact, there are three very specific things that Paul talks about after his first come on man moment. The first is this, communion is for community. It's really about Community. Here's how he says it. Verse 18. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been differences among you to which to show which of you have God's approval. I, I really like the ESV translation here. Verse 19 talks about the divisions that are in the church in Corinth that, that Paul's writing. He's like, I hear there are divisions, and I believe it. The English Standard Version translates the Greek this way, to show that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. There have always been div divisions and differences in the church, but this meal that we take is a meal that is supposed to pull us back together and unify us. Paul says those divisions happen, and they will show 
Paul's words, not ours. Paul says, it'll show those among you whose faith is genuine. He goes on to elaborate in verse 20. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or you, do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. This is, a, this is another big come on man moment right here for Paul. He's looking at the church in Corinth and still us today. And he says, you're not observing this meal the way this meal was intended. Uh, you, you probably need to know a little bit about the first century church. When they got together, they didn't have uh, large sanctuaries like what we're blessed with, you know, with you know, the sound system and all this. They had like someone's house. Like, okay, Roger, you got the biggest house. We're coming over, okay? Deal with it, bro. And they would get as many people as they could in the living room, and then it would spill out into the courtyard. And the function of their, the early church's time together was to have this meal. And so it was a full meal that people were eating, but here's what was happening. There was preferential treatment given to people in the community that everyone thought that they were more important than others. And so the best seats were saved for those on the inside of the house and people that they thought didn't matter, lesser people in their view. They would be on the outside and everyone on the inside would get a, a really good meal and people on the outside, the food just never got there. And Paul said, do not call what you are doing the Lord's meal, because the Lord's meal brings us together. And he's redirecting them. I mean, God tactically puts this kind of like project in front of us because he knows that we need sustenance to live. You have to have food to live. But the meal that we are eating is not a meal so that I mean, there's not enough energy and that tiny little cracker and a little bit of grape juice to get you to your car, okay? Okay. Like, this is not a meal that is going to sustain any of us, but it is a powerful spiritual meal. And what was happening here is no one was observing the, the, the sacredness and the honor due the person the focus is supposed to be on. Instead, they were coming together and they were just having a big meal. And Paul says, don't you dare call this church. Because church doesn't show preferential treatment the way man does. Church pulls the entire body together for one experience together. And one way that we get off track in this meal is we do communion at times in an isolated environment. And its original intended purpose was a meal for all of us. If this was supposed to be just for you and your time alone, you could do it throughout the week in your closet, like Jesus says in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, you want to communicate with me in a personal way? You go find an inner room in your house. We do this together because this meal is to bring us together because you need Jesus and I need Jesus. And we acknowledge that we all need him as one body together. And our unity in partaking this meal together brings pleasure to our God. We have to reinstitute the we part of communion. Here's the next thing. Paul talks in verse 27, and we see this. Communion is for believers. It is for believers only. Here's what he says. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Make, make it really clear that the heart of Jesus is that everyone would be in. He's an inclusive God. Everyone that does not believe that he is the son of God, he stands at the, the door to their heart and he knocks, says the gospels, waiting to be let in. But if you do not believe Jesus is the son of God, this is not a powerful meal where you connect with one another and Jesus, this is a snack of no significance. And to take it in an unworthy manner is warned against in God's word. This meal is only for believers. And he goes on to explain why. See, commun communion is to be communing with him in an intentional way. We need to commune 
intentionally. Here's the last thing that he tells us with instructions in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. This isn't like the message got long and boring. Uh, and this is, they've died. They came to this powerful meal that's meant to connect us to God. He left it for us. And they approached it with a casualness and a flippancy. It's almost taking the names Lord in vain is what this would be. That there would just be a, a, a way that we would go through this that was just very laissez-faire and we would not treat it with honor and respect and understand that we are actually entering into holy ground. And the warning here is for this, that only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and have examined themselves should come to this table. And that's the only manner that's worthy. It doesn't mean that we beat ourselves up or we sit around feeling sorry for what Jesus did, but we have a proper understanding that this meal is solely focused on what he did, what he is currently doing, and what he is going to do in the future. I um, My mind goes back to a moment when I think I really began to understand communion in a different way. And I was actually taught by my seven-year-old son, uh, we were having one of those Sundays at church where uh, they give all of the, all of the children's workers uh, kind of a weekend off, all right? And so there was no children's church, and so all the kids came to big church with mom and dad. Jennifer and I call that Sunday cage match, <laughs> right? It was like nice, quiet family worship, and we're wrestling Finley. Finley does nothing quietly. Uh, one of his spiritual gifts is loud. Uh, <laughs> And he's fully involved in the service um, and asking questions that uh, I, I, it would take me a week to answer, um, you know, just deep questions. And really, he, Finley is just as puzzled with the words of Jesus, the strange things that Jesus says in our core verse, as, as we all are at times. I mean, Finley is, he's there and they start to, to pass uh, the emblems and we had we did it at the church we attended in Missouri, just like here, where you have this awesome serve team, and they send the tray down the aisle, you know, and um, as the tray's coming down the aisle, this seven-year-old inquisitive boy, he's checking everything out, and Finley's like, you guys got snacks too? Right? And I hear people around me laughing, because he says it so loud. I mean, it's like we're in Walmart. I mean, aisle four can hear, okay? I'm in the back getting milk. I know where Finley is, trust me. And so everyone's kind of giggling a little bit, you know, and it's this, it's this quiet moment and they're playing the piano music and I'm like, hey, shh, not yet. It's, it's, not, it's not exactly snack time. It's, 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 you know, snack time is like not a big deal. This is, this is a very special thing that we're doing, Finley. And I'm drawn to this strange thing that Jesus said in 653, where he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And just like the reality of that kind of washes over my seven-year-old son's understanding of the moment because the, the screens and the words on the, on the screen are all talking about the death of our Lord. And Finley asks this question at an 11 volume. Why did Jesus die and he asked it so loud, and I, I felt like every row around us was like, the kid's got a great question. I, I didn't know if I should answer it at the same like, level as him, right? I'm trying to keep him quiet. And, and it hit me right there that like, the message of the gospel is, is so profound that you and I can spend the rest of our lives marveling at how amazing Jesus is, but yet a seven-year-old can understand it. And I tried to say it in the simplest terms to him. And I said, uh, Finley, Jesus died because of what dad did. Dad sinned. And Finley, you sinned. When you disobey mom, when you lie or when you hit your brothers, um, that sin, my sin, all of our sin, it separates us from God. And so Jesus, 
who never knew what sin tasted like. He never knew it. He went and died on the cross so we wouldn't have to. And I said this, I said, so this meal that we're having, we are celebrating what Christ did. The look on Finley's face. He's like, Dad, this is not a celebration. It's not, he's just looking around. He sees like, there's a disconnect here. There's a lot of things that we put into this moment. But Paul describes it this way, and I think his greatest instruction to us, verse 26, he says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. This is the sermon that you preach every time we gather together with one another. And you take this cup and you raise this cup. You are proclaiming the Lord's death. And there are, there are times for us as a church where I, I think that we do get into a routine of, you know, three songs, um, a communion moment, prayer, offering, message, goodbye. It's just, you know, we do it. But really... Everything that we experience from the time you get out of the parking lot, getting a cup of coffee, giving someone a hug, praying with someone that's having a rough day for some reason that has nothing to do with what's happening here, just all of that is really this communing moment. And seven-year-olds can get it. You can get it. When you raise this cup, there's a lot of things going on in this moment. But more than anything, you are preaching that Jesus died. And you are identifying everything in your life with that fact in history. Because not only are we celebrating his death, because we need it, but we're celebrating the victory that he rose from the dead and the hope that we have that he is returning. And we need time in this moment to to not partake of this in an unworthy manner. We need to examine ourselves so that we don't just run into this haphazard meal. This is a beautiful encounter with the real God that wants to live inside of us. And if you're a believer, he does live inside of you. And Jesus is saying this, if you don't believe, eat my flesh, drink my blood. If you don't believe on the Son of God, you have no part of eternal life. And so what we're saying is I believe. Not only do I believe, but I need it. And I identify my whole life with what you did on that cross. And so we're going to do it differently today. It's really functional at times for us to have the serve team pass it to us and we kind of get a set in our seats and Just take the two cups and reflect on what he's done. This is a time to think about what he has done for us on the cross, but to think about and thank him for what he's doing in your life right now. If he's doing nothing in your life right now, this is a moment for you to say, Jesus, do something in my life. Wake me up. But also to thank him for what he's going to do. So we're going to ask people in just a moment to stand and to come to the Lord's table, to come to it. I think there's something about that action. One is we're going to mingle with one another a little bit. You're going to have to be like, oh, excuse me, pardon me. Hi. We're going to have to recognize other people in this moment because we're reinstituting the we part. This is a communion meal. We're together. And so it'd be very appropriate during the time that we have set aside for this in in our service for you to give give some hugs, grab some people and pray. The front of the stage, the reason we don't put chairs all the way up here is we want some space for us to have a a place where we say, we want to meet with God. You can come and kneel at the steps. We're making this an altar today where we come before him. You take this cup, you can kneel at the steps and pray and have a moment of reflection. You can take it back to your seat and put your your face in your hands and just have a a moment with yourself to examine. But let's have moments of community right now. Let's have moments of examining ourselves right now. And let's have moments of just Christ-centered worship. Jesus, we come before you just simply doing what you told us to do. We are remembering you. We are confessing sin. 
We are preaching the sermon that you died and we're, we're saying we're building our whole lives on that. So as they sing a new song over this moment, could church just break out right now? As we do the very thing that you've asked us to do, focus our time on how good you are. It's in your name we remember you now, Jesus. Amen. When you're ready, we...